so this video comes after the subsetting video and so um, really it's missing data is often tied to subsetting because you usually want to get rid of it or do something with it uh, but missing values in your data set will be listed as NA so not available uh, remember that NAN is not a number and NA is not available so they're different things um, sometimes the NAN error is uh, when you try to do something with an NA though so they are kind of tied together you can get away with them being in the data set sometimes, sometimes you can't. Um, if you try to calculate the mean on a column with missing data, it just gives you an NA back, so you can't get away with it. But let's say you're trying to run maybe a regression analysis, often they'll get ignored. So it just kind of depends on what you're doing, if missing data is usable or not. Um, <clears throat> so how do I figure out what missing data is and what do I do with it? So a lot of the functions that I'll talk about in the, the next video have missing data um, omission options. So there's a way to get rid of it within the function you're working on, but often they don't. Um, so, and they all do it a little bit differently. So one of the biggest issues is just figuring out how does that function deal with NAs? And if they don't, what do you do about that uh, dealing with the NA? Um, there are a bunch of separate NA functions. They don't often do what you would think they would do. Complete cases is one of my favorites um, in NA omit. So let's look at uh, the air quality data set again, because it's an easy one and it has NAs. So let's do complete dot cases. So what complete cases does is it tells you true or false if the row has a complete uh, set of data. So it gives you a whole bunch of trues and falses, which is not what you wanted probably. And looking at it, what it does, it says true. All the data is there. All the data is there. All the data is there. Oh, no. Number five, it's missing some data. Six is missing some data. So it just tells you true or false if they have any missing data points. It doesn't really tell you how many. So you can use that true-false to just um, subset out the data. <clears throat> so I'm going to take the air quality data set, and then I'm going to um, <clears throat> use complete cases, air quality, right? and then give me all the columns back. So give me only the rows with complete data, comma, all the columns. And that's one way to get rid of all of the NAs very quickly. So it got rid of the lines that had at least one NA value. Okay. Now that is like sort of taking a hammer to a data set because let's say you want to only exclude the people who are missing 15 items or something. There are better ways to deal with um, missing data, but that is like the quick and dirty way. There's even a faster one, which we'll get to in just a second, but... <clears throat> um, Complete cases is great. Uh, there are more elegant solutions though. So um, we just went over this, where complete cases tells you if the entire row is complete, so true is totally complete, false is incomplete. Uh, another way, and so a uh, faster way to do this that doesn't involve remembering rows and columns is na.omit. So omit all of the NAs. <clears throat> so it will, in, it will omit any row um, that has NAs. So that, should, that gives us the exact same set of data. Uh, so it gets rid of all the NAs in the data set really quickly. Um, now, uh, you look over here, I have, still have 153 observations. Well, that's because I'm not saving these. Remember, if I'm getting output, I can see the output, it's not being saved. So I'm just kind of showing you what it does so I can test different functions. If you wanted to save this, you could say air quality equals na.omit air quality. Or you can kind of do... Um, a, make it a separate data set. So um, no missing equals na.omit error quality. Okay. Try to make your variable names um, memorable. So no missing is pretty obvious what it is. <clears throat> uh, is.na is a really great function that uh, works on individual values rather than entire rows. So is.na can be a great way to sum up the number of missing values. So you can look at each column and total up the number of missing values a person has so that you can determine if they are um, within the realm of replacement. 
So when we get to data screening, we'll talk about data replacement and uh, multiple imputation methods to replacing missing data that's missing at random. And one of the things that you want to know is how much data is missing per column and how much data is missing per row. Because you don't want to fill in participants who are missing more than, more than really 5% of their data, but especially half. So we've all had those survey designs, and if you haven't, awesome, wish it could be you, um, where a participant just gets bored in the middle and they quit. Well, you don't want to fill in all of their data because, um, duh, and that would be making up their data. And so is .NA is a great way to sum the missing data by column and by row. Um, and we'll, when we get there, we'll talk about the apply function that will kind of help us do that um, <clears throat> in a quick way. But uh, it gives, it's still a true-false operator, but if you sum a true-false operator, it adds up all the truths. So is that an A? True would be missing, false would be zero. Uh, and we'll, we'll use that function more when we get to data screening. Okay. So that is all the missing components I'm going to talk about right now, um, mostly because missing values really depends on the type of function you're using. So instead, I'm going to get into um, some other components to R itself that um, I think are important, not necessary for you to um, know to be able to use R, but once you know it, it'll make your life easier. Uh, so there's uh, this thing called the working directory. <clears throat> the working directory is where your R is currently saving data. Um, and so that's sort of like what folder you have open. Now you might have a file open that the working directory is a different thing. So let's type get wd to see where the computer is currently working. Let's save this file. wd. And it tells me that it's currently saving things in my users folder on my Mac. If you're on Windows, you'll have a much longer one that starts with usually a C for your computer. <clears throat> and so that's where it's currently saving information. Right? And that's the path. It's called a path name for my directory. Well, what the hell can I do with that? Well, I can set the working directory by using set wd. <clears throat> but the problem that I find with, the, uh, with most people who are trying to learn any computing language, but especially R, is they're not used to talking about paths. And so you can think paths as sort of like um, web addresses. You know, you got HTTP, you got the www stuff. Computers have the same kind of setup where they have specific folders that are saved, so it's got it's got a um, a path, a list of where to go to find that information. <clears throat> um, but given that this is a computing language, the um, let me go back here. The uh, slashes are in the opposite direction. So when you look at a path on your computer. The slashes will go in the different, the other direction. Now, Macs are not so great to do this on because um, they have this sort of visual representation of paths down here. Windows does this too, but you can actually click on it and get it to give you the physical path. Uh, so let me find a particular folder here so we can look at my sim <coughs> um, syllabus. I can right click on it and do get info. When I do that, it tells me the path for it here. So that is where the folder is. Um, and so I could copy that path and cut and paste it here. And the cool thing is, if you're on a Mac at least, it um, auto put the slashes forward. If you're on Windows, it doesn't work that way. So what I tell you to do is instead of dealing with all that crap, um, since you're in studio, what you can do is go to session, set working directory, and I could pick one. <clears throat> so I could pick where I wanted my, my computer to be saving. So I'm going to stick it in downloads just because this is a video I'm making. And so it set the working directory to downloads. So what you do is you copy that, paste it up here in your syntax, and save that for later. Why would you ever want to do that? Well... Let me give you a good reason. Okay. Um, and then once you, oops, oops, sorry. Once you do that, let me sidetrack just a second. What you'll see is under the files folder, it will move to that file. Um, so that's where the where why it's starting where it starts under files. Okay. All right. 
So why would I do this? I can use set working directory in a script to point to specific files. So um, let's say I want to import a, a file in a folder and I'm one of these lovely people who likes folders and folders and folders. I like everything to be super organized. And so I could every single time tell it to import that specific file with this huge long folder name. Or I could say, here's my working directory, that's where the file is, and then just use the name of the file. <clears throat> and that gets to be much better when you're importing files that Studio doesn't let you import directly. So what I'm going to say is, hold on to the working directory idea, and I will show you in a couple of minutes why that is so helpful. So trust me on this one. <clears throat> um, until then, hold on to working directory. Um, but in, in a nutshell, working directories are where the file is going to save stuff. That's essentially what it is. Or pull things from. <clears throat> Packages, so kind of a different topic here. Packages are add-ons that allow you to do different types of analyses rather than code them there yourself. So um, R comes with a bunch of pre-programmed functions. It's called base R. And anytime you look at the help window, you can tell what package you're using because it'll say next to the the function uh, on the little brackets here tell you what package it's in. So let's say I wanted to look up how to do a CFA, question mark CFA. Remember that's how I look up for health functions. It's sort of like uh, I don't know what to do because you haven't told me where to find it. So I can double question marks and that will search a bunch of stuff <clears throat> for me. And give me some results down here. So it went through all of my stuff. It says, well, you've got one in Levon here. And so that is in this particular CFA version is in the package Levon, okay, which is a structural equation modeling package. <clears throat> and so packages are ways to sort of import more utility into your R. Okay. These packages are checked and monitored by CRAN, so um, the R network. And that means there's just a little bit of oversight to them. Now it's not perfect. Um, and uh, when R updates, packages also have to update. Um, and so sometimes packages don't necessarily come along with the version of R uh, that just got updated. So it's always helpful to sort of wait. So don't update R as soon as R can be updated. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Um, unless there's a major flaw, and then obviously you should. Uh, so many uh, other things are programmed and they're on GitHub. So GitHub is a really fantastic resource for programmers uh, where people can program things and other people can contribute. It's really awesome. Some of our coding information is on GitHub. But you have to use that at your own risk because it has not been monitored. Some researchers make entire careers out of checking the math for packages um, and arguing over whether or not they work appropriately. I find it fun to just kind of watch and see what they say and then use packages that have been well supported. Um, because I don't know that I always want to get into like some super crazy least squares checking. I just want it to run least squares, you know? <clears throat> so packages are monitored. Each time R updates, the packages sometimes get updated with it and sometimes they don't. Now most of the big packages that people use are like, like a lot, like CAR, which is a really popular one, or Psych for Psych people. They get updated kind of quickly um, and so if you're looking for a specific package and you've updated R and uh, you can't update it the normal way which I'll show you in just a second you can google it and get the is a tar or actually while we're here a zip file you can import from either one um, tar files are taught uh, TGZ I believe <clears throat> so you can actually install a package manually as well as install it from CRAN directly so packages can be found that maybe they just didn't feel like updating it anymore but mathematically it's still appropriate it's just that they didn't want to keep up with R um, and so they have them available to download but it will give you a little warning like this package was built with an old version of R you should be warned and that's okay <clears throat> all right so I can install them directly by typing install.packages and then the name of the package. So let's install car. You do have to be on the internet for this to work. I have car installed, but it'll just update it for me. So I can type install 
dot packages and then car. <clears throat> so then you would wait for it to do its thing. <clears throat> So that installed the package for me. So if I click on packages over here, I can actually see all the ones I have installed, which is quite a lot. Um, and then it put car here at the top. So companion to applied regression, pretty pop pop popular package, <clears throat> at least in what I do. Uh, and so that installed the package for me. The great thing about install.packages, if you want to use that code and stick it in your syntax file, is now you're portable. So what do I mean by portable? I can go to a computer in like our research lab, not my lab, but like, you know, the computing lab. As long as they have R and Studio installed, I could run this code and be back where I started. Um, so one thing about our campus is that the computers on the network reset every single time you turn them off. So yes, they have the proper program installed, but they do not have all these packages. And so if I keep this in here, it won't really hurt me because it'll just update the package if I already have it. Um, but if I don't have it, it will install it for me and then you'll be good to go. You'll be set to run that analysis. <clears throat> or you just bring your computer everywhere. That works too. The other way you can install packages that's a little faster or easier or not so much typing is through Studio. So what I would do is click on install and then I would type one. So I could type car in here, tell it to install. Okay. It gives me the exact same code <clears throat> um, that I just typed. So uh, that's a quick way to do it, to install. The other way that I was talking about with downloading the tar files is you click install. And instead of repository, you click package archive file. And then that's where it'll let you pick a file to um, install. Now, if you're on a Mac, it requires it be a tar um, package archive. If you're on Windows, you can actually do um, zip files. So where would you get those from? Well, internet. So let's search for one I've been using a lot lately, Levon package. <clears throat> and so this is their actual own homepage, but there's a uh, CRAN page for Levon and I could download it here so here's the package source or I could do it in Windows or um, here's Mavericks or if you have Snow Leopard you can download like for previous um, iterations of uh, Max <clears throat> right so these are the files where you would download and that's how you would install it since Levon has been updated with R it's fine I don't even know that I have it installed. So let's see what happens when I do install. Levon. Go. Because <clears throat> I just updated my R. And then now see it's over here. So latent variable analysis. <coughs> okay. So we went through this. Great. I have that package installed. What now? So here's the problem. Every time a package is installed, that does not mean that it comes on. So anytime you start Studio, basically the only thing that's loaded is, is a couple of base packages. <clears throat> and so that's sort of as if uh, you have SPSS and it has all of these functions, but they're not on. You have to turn them on. So it does save you computing power by not loading everything that you have saved as packages until you need it. Um, you will run something without turning on the right package. Everybody does it. It's a thing. Uh, I still do it. And I, if you watch my videos on um, how to do SIM and R, that's like the first line of every video. It's, okay, we're going to cover this. Be sure you turn on the library. Okay, so um, it's a really common mistake uh, that everyone makes. <clears throat> All right. Now, um, my word of warning is when they're loaded, they're, or when they're installed, they're called packages. When you go to use them, they're called libraries because consistency is not really statistics forte. <clears throat> and so uh, how do I turn the packages on or load them up? Uh, and I think they're called libraries because think about that for a second. Like this is where it knows to find all the books or the resources for your <clears throat> analysis. So if I want to turn them on, I can just type library. Okay, and it turns purple because that's a reserved word. 
and I just want a low car. So I can tell car to come on. <clears throat> we'll take a second, especially if it's being grumpy like my computer. You can notice the little checkbox came on. And so that turned on car. So I could do any of the functionality with car that now. Or you could just click the little box next to it. Okay. My problem with the box clicking version is that it does a bunch of this stuff here, lib.local. Um, if you are trying to be portable, so you're trying to work at home and on a on a school computer or something, you don't want that piece on there because otherwise it'll get cranky because that um, <clears throat> path directory will not be on your computer and the computer on campus. So I always tell people to just, if you do it that way by clicking on it, uh, lop that part off when you cut and paste it so that your code is portable to another computer. Okay, so you can use quotes or you don't have to. <clears throat> To install it, it has to have the quotes. So there's your inconsistent quotes issue again. <clears throat> okay. um, I That's usually the first thing I type at the top of every document, other than some little notes to myself, is uh, libraries. So it will load the libraries at the beginning of my analysis. And then the only problem I tend to have is if R crashes in the middle or I get distracted and I close it and I go do something else and I come back. Um, and I start in the middle of an analysis, and then I'm like, ah, oh, damn it, it didn't load the libraries. But then I know where the library code is. It's always at the top. And that's just a personal thing that I think works pretty well. <clears throat> okay, so we're, gosh, where we're coming back to why working directories. And this is the section where it's going to be important. <clears throat> so there are data files that come with base R. Um, so that air quality data set that I've used in a couple videos now is part of base R. And you don't technically have to load them, but for you to be able to see them in the environment window over here that I've made too small to see. So for you to be able to see them over here, it, it helps if you to load them. So I could just type data here to see all of the data sets. And it's actually going to tell me about the data sets in car. Um, and the data sets in data sets, which is part of base R, so that's where air quality is hiding, I believe. And then it also tell me the data sets in any package I have open. <clears throat> so since I have car and Levon open, it's going to tell me all about what I could possibly use at the moment. <clears throat> and so I could type data, and if I do open and close parentheses, I can get a list of possible ones. So let's open this BERT one, why not? <clears throat> And that loaded the, da the BERT data. I've already told you about the head function that allows you to see the first six lines. And it looks like that data has um, IQ information in, in it. <clears throat> the cool thing is if you do the question mark and then the name of the data set, it actually will pull up um, the information on the data set and tell you where it's from. So that's nice. Uh, and we did this. So, the biggest problem in the switch to R if you're used to SPSS is it's just not nearly as visual as Excel or SPSS. But Studio will give you somewhat of a video. Now, I've been using this already because you know, sometimes it's hard to remember that you already know how all this works when you're teaching it. But um, <clears throat> Now, here's really what's going on. You can type view to view it. Now, view is one of the fun functions that is actually capitalized. So it is a capital V. If you do lowercase v, it goes, I don't know what you want. So view, and let's view that BERT data, just to do something a little different than the notes. And what that does is it pulls open this um, window here and shows me what's in the data set. <clears throat> I mean, I can also click here and look at the the follows, excuse me, um, or I can do the view here. Now the newest versions of Studio actually have the ability to filter them, which is kind of nice because that is a lot of the subsetting stuff that we were talking about. Um, so the filter function uh, allows you to filter, but that does not make it permanent. So I can filter on the fly um, sorry, I popped it out into a new window, but that does not actually save the filter over here. So, uh, kind of nice because I can see if I have any specific problems. I can also sort um, 
high and low to see if I have any out of range data. But um, if you actually want to subset the data, you have to do the subsetting functions. <clears throat> All right, so that's the view function. Remember, capital V. If you do the lowercase v, you'll get an error message. Cannot find function view. You would think this would be obvious, but it's not. Right. <clears throat> the other thing you can do, sorry, is click on it in the environment window. So over here, you can click on that value. And so anything under data can be clicked on and viewed over here. Your, vec your uh, single vectors cannot. <clears throat> So I can import all types of files, um, and we're going to use our commander to do some of this stuff, and it actually will import files in a, um, in a fairly good way. Uh, so it's actually a little easier than some of the other ways to import files. Uh, but CSVs are most definitely the easiest files to load. You can do any type of text file with a specific separator and a bunch of, a bunch of different things, but CSVs are definitely the easiest. So let's import from Studio. Um, now the import data set from text file in Studio really only works on text. So if you've got an SPSS file, you have to do something different. So it's from text file. <clears throat> and then let's find us a CSV here. <clears throat> so let's pull up the lab for my class. So chapter one lab, that's CSV. And so I've got a couple of different options here. So I can change the name of it. I can call it data set one or something. Um, and then looking down here, it says, I'm gonna pull this in as a data frame and here's what it's gonna do. So that's actually not correct because the column names are in the data set, but it's not pulling them up. It's calling them V1, V2, V3. So I wanna click heading here over to yes, and that will fix it. So the bolded part right here is the name of the data of the column. It's going to pull in. It's going to make those the um, <clears throat> column names. Now row names. If you leave it as automatic, will make them one, two, three, four, five. If you have row names, you can use the first column. I don't want to do that, but I could. Uh, and then there are a couple of other things you can fix here, uh, but generally those are the two big things. And then I'll click import. <clears throat> It shows me the data set automatically, and then now I have it imported over here. <clears throat> so what that does, though, is here. So let me copy this big line of code and show you what I mean about why working directories. Okay. So one of the things, let me make this bigger over here, that that function does so uh, specifically, this is the read.csv function. So the read.csv does exactly what it sounds like. It reads CSV files. And there are actually a whole bunch of um, extra options you can use on read.csv except just the name of the path. Uh, but it's easiest if we start with just like, here's how you'd import one. <clears throat> okay. That being said, look at this gigantic path here. Uh, that is very specific. That is this computer. If I wanted to be able to tr to go from one computer to another, what I could do is first, um, hold on, let me see. First, set the working directory. <clears throat> okay. So I would do um, set the working directory. So I'm going to do that under session because I find that a little easier. So set session, set working directory, choose directory. So I'm going to choose that directory I just picked. So let me get to it. <clears throat> okay, so oops, I want to set it to this particular working directory. Go. So I'm going to copy that. Okay, it's already done because it's down here at the bottom, but I'm going to paste it here. And then you see all this stuff here. I can now delete it out of my read.csv. Boink. And now I can tell it to just read that file. And it will look for that file in this folder. Okay, and it imported it just fine. Um, if I hadn't set the working directory and tried to run just this, it would have freaked out. And so when you import files, it gives it the big, long, huge name. But this is a way to, again, make it portable. Because if I'm on campus, here's what I often do. I go home computer. And then I might do lab computer and set the working directory for the lab. Okay. 
um, and then I will tell it to run one of those, whichever one I'm at, and then I'll be pulling the data. <clears throat> and that allows me to switch back and forth between our my Mac at home and our Windows machines in our research lab. And so that's why the working directory thing is useful. <clears throat> All right, so we had talked about all of this. Okay. So read.csv.csv is a function that reads CSV files. Read.table is another function that reads a whole bunch of different types of files. And then um, importing SPSS packages, I really like Mimisk more than I like Foreign. So there's several packages that will do SPSS imports. And to me, um, the miscellaneous one is much better. <clears throat> so let me show you. Um, so I don't think I have that package installed since I just updated my R, so I'm going to install it first. Mimisk. <clears throat> okay, so it did, the th it did all of that. And then, remember, you got to load that library. So it's going to load a whole bunch of stuff that it told me about. And so Mimisk has um, tools for managing survey data. <clears throat> and what it'll let you do is um, import SPSS files. So I'm going to set my working directory to something else real quick. So session, set, let me pick a directory that has some SPSS files in it, which would be, let's look at my some old assignments here. So you can set the working directory multiple times within one syntax file. So I'm going to set it to that folder. Now what I can do is use the Mimisk code to import an SPSS file. So I'm going to copy all this. <clears throat> As a graduate student showed it to me once and I have loved them ever since. So as a data set, SPSS system file, what I want to change here is SPSS data. So what I want to do is call it Yes, it should be in quotes, but I also want to call it whatever the name of the data set is. So let me look at one here. Oh, wait, now that I have my um, <clears throat> working directory set, I can look here. So I have chapter one assignment dot save. So chapter one assignment dot save. And it has to be spelled the exact same way with the same types of caps and everything. Use value labels true to data, tra data frame equals true. Now I want to call that something data equals that. <clears throat> and so it should have imported. Um, it imported as a formal class data set. Um, and that's fine. It works very similar to a data frame. If I wanted to um, change that, I could do data equals as data dot frame instead. Data. And that would stick it up here. They're not terribly different. Okay. <clears throat> um, but the cool thing about setting the working directory is I didn't have to remember all this crap. It did it for me as part of Studio. And then I could just type the name of the file that I have on here under files. And so that makes it much easier to pull in data. <clears throat> okay. Another option, because there's 6 million, is our commander. Um, and this is what Andy Field actually talks about in his book. Um, and I just don't have Commander. <clears throat> so let me see if I can get it to load. I had updated my R to match what my students were looking at, so I don't have it. But what R Commander will let you do is use, it uses the uh, package foreign. So foreign will let you import different uh, types of files as well, but I find that it makes more mistakes sometimes, and I might just be using it wrong, but um, then Mimisk, the Mimisk package does. Okay. And that's going to be cranky and go really slow, so let's <clears throat> keep rolling. As you install these packages, if you're on a Mac, let me give you a quick word of warning. You might have to stall, install X11, Xquartz. These are things that deal with... Um, GUIs and, um, sorry, graphical interfaces and um, plots, they're cool. They won't hurt you. They're not, um, they're not spam. So install those. 
And then every once in a while, Max will throw this non-zero exit status error message. If that's the problem, uh, you can email me. I can tell you how to fix it because Googling it took me a long time. But there's a missing Fortran package. So that's how ridiculous this is sometimes because Fortran is a very old computing language now. Um, but there are some little Fortran packages you have to install first and then install Commander and life will be better and it'll work. Um, I apparently made my computer pretty angry. Not entirely sure what that's about. So let's keep going and see if it'll install and then we can use um, our commander here in a minute. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and then everything that I've just talked about imports the data set as a data.set or a data.frame and you can coerce between the two if you need to be one or another. Okay. Uh, you can clear the workspace. You don't have to do that, but if you're like me and every once in a while you're like, just clear all this crap out, I gotta start over and I don't wanna see anything I've already screwed up because then I know what I have open and I don't. You can click on the little broom and the little broom will clear everything out. Oh, there it goes. So it installed our commander. Let's see if we can get it to load. <clears throat> so it, it's missing some packages. Although I do love the package name sandwich. All right, here's commander. So commander is an extra window that opens that's really meant to be, I read on someone's website that it was a way to limp along learning R until you figured it out. And I know that was a pretty good summary of Commander, um, but kudos to the people that program this because as a teaching tool, it's really fantastic. And as a learning tool, if you've never done R before, um, really, I think is a good way to start. <clears throat> Wish I had figured that out beforehand. So one thing you can do is load data sets. So data, load data set or you can import data. And this is where it actually gives you options for a whole bunch of different types and not just SPSS. But I could pick SPSS, let me call it data2 or something like that. Click OK. Sorry, popped off screen. And I could pick a specific one. Let's try chapter two and open. Okay. Now it ran a bunch of that. Now the way that our commander runs down in your console looks very different, but essentially gives you the code that it used. So here's the code name, uh, all the code for the script. I can hit submit and that would do stuff down here. <clears throat> um, but my problem is that it didn't actually load the data set. It gave me an error message. Okay. Um, and so I really like this. And it looks like the data set is loaded, but it doesn't always um, run it uh, back over here in the studio for you. But you can now, it is loaded over here, uh, edit the data set. That is something that studio does not do. That's really awesome. Uh, or use it to build um, <clears throat> a bunch of different, uh, to do some actual statistical modeling, right? Uh, but the problem is like, if I wanted to run it, get it down here in studio and then play with it, what I'd have to do is copy it all and paste it down here. <clears throat> okay. And that is actually going to do some other stuff because I clicked on some other buttons. But then the data would be loaded over here. Okay, so there's the actual data. <clears throat> um, foreign is a great package and that's what it uses, but um, I like uh, Mimisk as well. Nope, sorry, couldn't get it to go away. All right, but Commander's really neat, and you'll see Commander again if you keep watching these videos for my uh, graduate statistics course. So I can clear the workspace by clicking on the little broom. Uh, RM and RM and remove work as well, but you have to type each one one at a time. That's annoying. So uh, clear the workspace does all of them at once. Okay. And that's where I'm going to end this video and start my next video on functions and finish out these notes. But... Um, that should get you some good ideas on how and why you'd want to use working directories, uh, missing values, and then sort of uh, the quick gist on packages. <clears throat>